Salut tout le monde, aujourd'hui on a une petite surprise pour vous. On a Franco Cohen avec nous. Hello Frank, how are you? I'm good, how are you? So, Frank, it seems impossible to not know you, but uh, maybe some member to not know you, so could you introduce yourself please? Um, you're right, it's impossible, everyone should know who I am. No, I, I'm Frank O'Connor, I am Franchise Development Director on uh, Halo 4. Uh, at 343 Industries, uh, and before that I worked at Bungie. Uh, I worked on every Halo game except Halo 1, unless you count Anniversary, uh, which is cheating, but I'm going to count it anyway. So, so some fan would say you have the best, the best job in the world. So, what is a typical day? For Frank O'Connor at Fulfillment Industry? Um, there, there, there really isn't a typical day. I mean, I think that uh, the, the, the nature of my job means that I have to do different things uh, all the time. You know, at the start of the project, it's working out what the story is going to be. At the start of the project, is working out what is the, the overall content and the concept of the game going to be. Um, so, in the case of Halo 4, that was. You know, some of it is really easy. We're going to continue the story of the Master Chief. We're going to follow up and find out what happens to John and Cortana, and what is that? You know, what is that world that they're in orbit around at the end of Halo 3 I means? Some of that stuff is easy. And then you cut to three and a half, four years later, and we're I'm traveling around Europe, uh, introducing the game, and 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 in some ways, really just taking credit for a lot of other people's hard work. I mean, the the I'm definitely. Uh, one of the faces of Halo, and I work on the game, obviously, I work on the story and the fiction and the franchise, but it's a big team, and, and uh, the, typically I'm out there uh, expanding and extolling the virtues of the game that a bunch of other people worked much harder than I did to create, uh, and people with more talent and more ability. Uh, so it's uh, it's humbling part of the job, but it's a necessary part of the job because we, we kind of have to get the message out there and explain to people what Halo is all about. So um, how 343 was born and um, who started this uh, project and uh so uh, about four years ago when we were going through the, the you know the process of uh, spinning up Bungie um, and I was still working at Bungie at the time and we were actually independent at, you know I can't remember the exact date but it was October of I want to say 2007 something like that and we we'd started to spin our process um, I had uh, I had joined Bungie because I was a Halo fan. I mean, it was as simple as that. I loved the universe. I loved the game that they'd built, and I loved the the uh, the whole thing. Um, the, it was kind of bittersweet for me to to split off from Microsoft because I had a great time working. I mean, I worked at Microsoft. It's easy to think of Bungie and Microsoft as separate entities, and it was a studio within Microsoft. But I loved the support that we got. I loved a lot of the people that we worked with externally at Microsoft as we viewed it from that studio. And, uh, and I knew I was going to miss Halo, and, and I knew the next project was going to be amazing, but Halo was the thing that, that I was really passionate about. And so uh, about four years ago, Bonnie Ross uh, came to visit us, and they were going to take over the franchise. And so they came to, you know, get the story Bible and talk with us about where the universe was headed and find out, you know, capture as much of that sort of essence and that lightning in a bottle as, as, as she could. And in talking with Bonnie and, uh, and another colleague of mine, Kiki Wolfkill, who you guys are probably familiar with it became very apparent it's easy to be cynical when you're in a studio and think microsoft is coming to like just turn in a business or or get a new team working on it and do they care about it and and do they love it and um early conversations with bonnie and kiki and uh, a couple of other people back at that time it became really really apparent that they 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 loved halo i mean bonnie has read every single halo novel like she could hold her on at, at comic-con with any halo nerd um and she's just super passionate about the universe and and i started to realize uh, during those conversations as i'm supposed to be giving them all this information and all this assistance so they can take over um that i that i wanted to stay with the universe and so uh the i was already a, a bungee employee at that point and um the opportunity to go back to microsoft and really sort of follow John's story and follow the Master Chief's story uh, became available and so I kind of jumped ship and it was uh, like I said it was bittersweet because I have a lot of friends at Bungie and, and a lot of admiration for their, their talent and passion but it was uh, ultimately mainly we I wanted to keep making Halo experiences and I wanted to go deeper and wider than, than we'd ever gone before and so that's where we are now that was really long <laughs> Was the end of Halo 3 designed to introduce a new Halo game, or did 
three for free uh, to rebuild everything from scratch. Um, you know, when we were working on on Halo Three, we you know that you're talking about the legendary ending where the Master Chief is he's he's won the war, he's won the battle. Um, and he's he's adrift in space, and you know we deliberately made that a cliffhanger. You know it was uh, not one that you really needed to know the ending of. You know the chief is ready and he's asleep. He's like the king under the mountain, and he's ready to be awoken at any time. And and uh, you know you, you see him drifting into orbit around this what's obviously a foreigner world, and it was always intended to be a foreigner world. And even at that time, we knew, we kind of had some ideas about what was down there and and who was on that world and and what its purpose was, but it wasn't fleshed out. Um, and it was supposed to be just a kind of a, an ellipsis, just a, a sort of continuation for people to think about and, and ponder as we moved on to other things. And of course, we were, uh, uh, you know, Bungie was still working on Halo Reach at that time, uh, even as we started uh, 343 prototyping what the what the idea for the story was, and we went through several iterations of that. And uh, but we also had the luxury of being able to iterate on technology as well. So we were able to take the the basically the a snapshot of the Halo Reach engine, and and tear it to pieces and look at the components and say what can we improve here? Where can we get more performance out of this engine? And what can we do to make uh, real Halo experiences just at a, a, a higher fidelity with 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 more of the stuff that people already love and that's you know 343 did that but obviously that's something Bungie would have done anyway if they'd been continuing on the franchise and it, it's sort of galling to read on forums when when people are talking about our graphics and how much better they are than Bungie's like they're forgetting that Bungie's last Halo game was three years ago and of course Bungie's if Bungie was making a Halo game now it would look as good as this right they're 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 brilliant technologists and uh, and artists, and we just have the advantage of time, and that's really what people are looking at in terms of comparison. Um, but uh, it was a very good experience, and and somewhat unique in that when you're when you're working on a studio and you keep making game after game after game, there isn't actually a lot of time to step back and do really good sort of high level prototyping and and do really significant overhauls to your engine. So we had some advantages there. And the other weird advantage that we had in building a team from scratch, we started with nine people. It was me, Bonnie, Kiki, a bunch of other people. Um, we were able to hire people from all over the industry, from from some of the best studios in the world, and every single person who we hired was a Halo fan. Like Now, some of them were you know, people who just like Team SWAT and Team Snipers and just wanted to make a hyper-competitive experience. Some of them were story fans. Some of them were music fans. But they were all people who had some passion or some love for Halo and they were able to bring that to our team, but also bring perspective and ability that we, we otherwise wouldn't have had. Um, it seems like uh, 343 Industries was in creation um, during the development of Halo 4. Uh, did this have a positive or negative impact uh, of the game? You know, you yeah. will probably... Uh, you know, it, was, it was definitely a positive thing, and it surprised me. I think that, you know, when we were we used to have contests to try and hire people because when you're trying to build a studio really fast um, you have to be really careful because you can't just hire anyone because if you make bad hiring decisions at the start you're gonna have to suffer the consequence of those in the long term um, but but it was still kind of a race so we were you know we were frantically recruiting and and it was a very competitive industry at that point so you're fighting to get the best people and and you know for every person that we hired you know they 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 had plenty of other opportunities. And so the people that we did end up with um, ultimately came, came and worked for us because they loved Halo. Um, and that was, uh, that was one of the unexpected and sort of unpredictable emergent uh, aspects of building a studio from scratch that was a huge positive in the end because, again, they, they loved Halo, but nobody thought it was perfect. They all had uh, sort of perspectives and ideas about how to how to evolve it and how to take it forward that were that were unique because they, these people came from different cultures and different sort of development backgrounds, and so they they had different ideas and different perspectives, and so it was a, a huge positive. Um, tell me, how free from industry and uh, Kenneth Scott just Holmes um, approached? the art direction for mm -hmm. Aero 4 because it's something very important yeah. in the franchise and uh, we see with Aero 4 the art direction is very strong mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, it is. You know, for Halo fans and, and you guys, you guys know this. It's it's uh, any change is controversial. Any change is controversial, and it's funny. You know, when we when we first revealed the Master Chief, it's like you've changed it, you've ruined it. Why does he look like this? And we 
the, w what people and you know that that was sort of pinned on 343 um, but the reality was that every time we'd made a new iteration of the Master Chief he changed pretty radically I mean if you go compare Halo 3 Master Chief to Halo 1 Master Chief and so on and some of it is dealt with in canon you know as Mjolnir Mark 5 versus Mark 6 and so on and some of it is just about artistic direction and you're gonna see that throughout the game you'll see it with the Covenant you'll see it with the way that uh, the way that certain objects are reinterpreted or, or built from scratch. Um, one of the biggest artistic challenges, obviously, was the uh, the world of Requiem and the Prometheans, and that was really interesting because we previously, with Forerunner architecture, these had been abandoned ruins, sort of like Greek ruins or Egyptian pyramids, where their their purpose and their their uh, history is shrouded in mystery. And you know, it's only fairly recently that we have a really good understanding of of what ancient Egypt was like and what all these things meant and what the purpose of these structures was. And so we approached it from that direction. What would happen if if these, and let's call them pyramids for a second, what would happen if these pyramids were inhabited and alive and their technology was functioning? And, uh, and so reimagining a forerunner world as a living, breathing space was the, the big drive behind that. It's, it's probably the same question, but I just want to know where do you, you find, find the inspiration for this game? Because when we see the armor for Halo 4, mm -hmm. like you said, it's very different from what mm -hmm. we know with Bungie. I just want to know where did you find the inspiration? It, it comes from uh, it comes from lots of different places, and we, of course we have multiple different artists. But Kenneth Scott is our art director, and so a lot of the conversations about the chief, and you'll see this in the uh, you'll see this in the way that he he animates and moves and, and even fights. Is how do we make it re still recognizably the chief and recognizably Mjolnir armor, but make it look a little bit more purposeful and a little bit more practical? Uh, and to one of the things we always wanted to do was was create a sense of weight and impact and and presence uh, in the especially in the chief's armor so that when you see him in a cutscene and when you see him interact with other people it feels it feels like this weird combination of a kind of lion waiting to pounce and a tank rolling through the room and he absolutely has to fill the room with his presence and be compelling and charismatic and enigmatic but also scary I mean he's a big hulking seven foot one ton monster of a man and you should feel that in the way that he, the way that he moves and in the silhouettes and the way that he looks and still but still fit within the sort of UNSC aesthetic. Uh, can you tell more about the season pass, uh, pass of Halo 4? Um, are you talking about the map pass? Uh, the season pass, yeah. Yeah, so the, the map pass is really very straightforward. It's just, a, it's just a sort of value proposition to buy the next three map packs in one uh, slightly reduced cost. So we have three map packs planned and they're being built uh, as we speak. Uh, and the map pass simply allows you to access those, those maps for, uh, I, I, I believe it's just a little bit cheaper than if you bought each of them discreetly. But it's not really a season pass, it's just a a fairly straightforward value proposition. And of course, if you buy the limited edition of the game, it comes with that, so. Can we expect maybe a season two or Spartan Ops season two? We, you know, we're treating Spartan Ops like a real TV show in some ways. We, we want to see if it's successful. We want to see if people enjoy it the way we expect they did. Uh, unlike, unlike TV shows though, where I think that they, they have zero expectation of success, um, they just have to, it's a real gamble for, for a TV show to, to start. Um, we, we know that there's a market for it and we know that there's an appetite for it and so we can make some predictions. So we were, unlike some TV shows, able to build a lot of story in advance so that if we, if we do get season two or season three or however this, this uh, expands or grows in the future, we know where the story is going so we won't have to sort of panic and make things up three seasons from now. So if the Spartan is a big success, we will have a season two like uh, Walking Dead or Game of Thrones. Uh, well, that's that's one of our hopes. Yeah, and we we just have to see the. We know how it plays, and you guys can try it yourself. And so we know how that feels, and we know what the 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 CG series looks like. It looks fantastic. It, it's it's actually really compelling fiction. One thing I often say is that it's not. Uh, you're not just going to see a cinematic of, you know, you have to blow up the generator and then you watch a cinematic of a generator blowing up. It's real people, real events, things happen, meaningful things happen. People will die, people will fall in love, there will be real relationships and real drama. Um, but uh, 
the uh, but what we don't know is how it's all going to tie together and how those conversations are going to go on Monday morning when you go back into work or school and you're talking about the fiction but you're also talking about the emergent things that happened in the game and you know you could be talking about that foreign artifact they found last night I did not expect it to do that uh, or I didn't expect that character to show up uh, but how they how those conversations tie in with I also didn't expect you to drive us all off the edge of the cliff on that warthog because you can't drive for shit. So um, we, we don't know how that experience is going to play out until it really airs, but we have some pretty good feelings about it. So yeah, we recently discovered a new Gantai float, float a new, because a new zombie mod. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. So can you give us some new information about it? Yeah, the uh, you know it's really just an evolution of the existing infected mode. There's some new rules, and uh, and again, I, you'd be better off talking to a designer about how the rules play out. And of course, they're malleable, and you can customize them. But uh, the main difference is that the uh, the 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 flood actually our flood you're you're a morphed spartan with a basically a kind of melee weapon just like a flood combat form head um and it's uh and in most game types uh you'll it's 12 players that's the the ideal number for if, uh you start with two flood uh spartans in the uh and it's uh, it's super fun. It's a, it's a much more streamlined, uh, visceral version of the the game that you're already familiar with, but obviously with the graphic impact of actually having something meaningful happen to the characters when they're infected instead of just changing color. Okay, but so it's something like Left 4 Dead, maybe it's a mm -hmm. can uh, climb the, the, wall, the wall. No, you're they're Spartans. They have different speed and movement and uh, <coughs> power, but they're they're still very much Spartans. It's not you 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 don't get any supernatural powers through your flood infection. The game comes on two discs. two discs. So yeah, one of the one of the discs contains uh, most of the multiplayer content, and you install that. Um, and one of the discs contains mostly the campaign stuff. So everything will launch from the main campaign disc, though. So if you think about the install disc, something like Forza, where yeah. you you install the content. Um, the the good thing about that is that. Um, it means that the the multiplayer stuff loads much faster than than it would off of a disc. So, one disc only for the company is awesome. Yeah, it just fits on <laughs> one disc. Yes, it's a lot of content. Six November. Yes. Reopen date of when you are the U.S. Yep. president. Yep. So why why this day? It's not. Uh, are you sure it's a good idea to release the game today? It's, you know, the, I think it is for, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, one is that, you know, our demographic is, uh, the, you know, the, the typical voting age in America is late 40s, early 50s. So we're not we're not really competing demographically. Uh, we want, we are working on a get out the vote campaign, though, where, where we work with a, a nonpartisan agency uh, to just encourage people to go vote that day. Because we're going to have a lot of students, sort of 18, 19 year old, who might be interested in taking the day off to play Halo. Well, if they do that, then they can also go vote. So we're we're uh, we're also going to reward uh, U.S. voters who who uh, prove that they vote uh, with with some Halo-related stuff. So we're trying to be good citizens there. Um, the reason that it's coming out on November sixth is really just a function of when the game is ready. Um, the you, you have to make a decision very early in the process, surprisingly early, like the beginning of this year, about when your exact release date is. And you have a rough idea about, you know, the Wii U comes out two weeks later, a week later, rather, on the same day as uh, Call of Duty, I believe. And so you know a bunch of these things going into that process, and you have to do the this sort of calculation about when the best time to release the game is. But ultimately, it's based on the schedule of uh, completing the game. And that's the thing that drives it. And then after that, it's a sort of a balance of marketing decisions and uh, uh, logistical uh, data that makes that decision, but uh, the other the other thing is that it's it's just the U.S. election. The rest of the world will be watching it, but there you know obviously it doesn't affect them quite as much as it does us. And uh, and I think that thirdly, the uh, people get bored during elections. You have all these tedious uh, TV commercials telling you about the uh, and you forget it's not just the presidential election. There's a sort of senatorial, sort of congressional uh, stuff happening at the same time. And you just get hammered and hammered with non-stop boring advertisements, and people are just looking for a break from that. So, uh, a, you know, a fun video game is a pretty nice break from that. Why did Microsoft wait so long to create what seems to be the Halo movie? Um, oh, you mean Forward Unto Dawn, yes. the the digital series? It's not. I mean, it's definitely not a movie. It's it's a TV series, and. Uh, and we're going to air it digitally. And really, we, we wanted to do something. It's been five years since Halo 3. And uh, 
a lot of people are not familiar with the Halo universe, and a lot of people have forgotten things about the Halo universe. And so we wanted to create a kind of primer uh, to bring people up to speed on what the UNSC is, what the nature of the Human Covenant conflict is. And we're also in that process able to put in a couple of characters who will show up in Campaign and Spartan Ops, and you'll get to see their origins in this series. And you'll also get to see some of the f very first interactions with the Master Chief. But it's not a movie. It's uh, it obviously something that happens at a smaller scale. And if you buy the LE, you get access to a version that's edited into a movie length piece. But uh, you know, a movie, if we ever make one, would be something that happened at a much more uh, dramatic scale. But we're really happy with the way forward Unto Dawn has turned out. It's a, it's a cool story, and it's about people. And that's that's. Uh, unusual for a video game, period, and, uh, and it's a really good way to find out about the Halo universe is through the perspective of real people. So, yeah, so coming up, Halo, how did you plan some improvement for Halo Waypoint website? And maybe the yeah. new, uh, to API, API from the .NET for the stats? So we're, uh, we'll have some updates to the way that stats are tracked and stuff, and, and uh, Halo Waypoint uh, online will go through something of a relaunch when the game comes out, but we'll have more to say about that later time. Just for you, was Halo anniversary a success? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, th th I'm glad there's no one from USPR here. Uh, it was, uh, it was a huge success for us. In fact, I think it was literally the best-selling remake yeah. ever. So, it was, yeah, it was a very, very big success for us. It exceeded, exceeded our expectations, uh, and was, a, and it was a really fun project to work on. We're all, we all loved Halo CE. And so it was actually kind of a labor of love, and we kept, we just kept adding things to it, you know, the, the, as we kept building. I think the, the most controversial thing we did, which was necessary, and uh, was was to add Reach content for the multiplayer portion, but Reach uh, population had really started to drop off, and so we, uh, you know, we felt like it was the right thing to do to keep the the whole ecosystem for for Halo players uh, healthy, and and Reach crept back up the charts as a result of some of that effort. Um, but the uh, but we we loved making it. It was really fun to go back and revisit a game that we some of us grew up with, and it was you know it was obviously a big inspiration to me. Uh, and and so being able to work on it, and also let me say that I've worked on every single Halo game. But okay. cheating. So maybe you can expect uh, Halo Two anniversary. No plans right at this moment. Halo Two would be a little trickier because the uh, Halo Two had online. Uh, multiplayer and uh, and there, there's a bunch of other aspects of Halo 2 that that would just make it a less simple proposition but there we've thought about it and there's maybe ways to do it that are they're a little bit unusual and a little bit interesting but there are no plans right now to do it just mostly conversations at this point uh, what happened to Eric Nylon? Uh, we do not get any, any information of him uh, since uh, some years now. Uh, he works. Uh, he still works at Microsoft. He works in the uh, in the uh, the sort of an franchise. Uh, sorry, the the sort of overall franchise narrative team over at uh, IEB uh, Microsoft Game Studios, uh, and he still writes. Uh, I believe he still writes game stuff. Uh, and we worked with him as recently as uh, as Halo Reach on the the Halsey Journal. He he wrote most of that. Um, so nothing happened to him. He's still there. <laughs> he's a, he's. No, he doesn't. He doesn't work for Halo. I mean, he has a lot of other things to do. But he's, you know, he's one of the foundational pieces of Halo. I mean, he he built uh, a huge amount of the Halo backstory along with uh, a guy called Rob McLeese back in the actually before the game came out. Uh, his novel was finished actually and released before Halo actually came out. So it's absolutely foundational. Eric's a great guy. So. Okay. Thank you. So I think it's it's done. Just. Uh, have you? Uh, we know that you love us. When I said us, yeah. Do you have a message for uh, for the community? For the yeah. Community? Um, the I do love the French community. Um, I'm Scottish, so if if you guys uh, are history buffs, look up the old alliance. So we, next time England gives us any crap, we'll team up and get them. Um, but the. Uh, but yeah, the thing I'd say to the French community is, I we hope three four three especially. We have a lot of French guys in the office and uh, and some French Canadians, which doesn't really count. But uh, uh, a lot of a lot of really cool French people in the in the studio, and they 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 want the French community to embrace three four three the way that they embraced Bungie. Um, we can't just expect that though. We have to earn it, and so. The, the first day that we earn it is the first day you guys play the game. So come play the game. Don't leak it. And uh, we'll uh, <laughs> and uh, and it takes longer than an hour to complete the first four missions. But um, as you will find out this afternoon, 
Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking forward to playing with and against you guys uh, on November 6th. Yeah, it's good. So you, you can say you love Halo Destiny? Uh, I, I d admire and respect Halo Destiny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing romantic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thank you.